Hmm. You know. Uh, yes. Um, this is a question for David. Uh, I'd like some kind of insight uh, into just what your process is in terms of uh, you know going out and hunting for those leads. Because I'm sure many of us can relate. You know, some of us, I'm sure, have tried to gone out you know, uh, and get gigs and whatnot. But uh, I mean, is there any like particular kind of you know, way you have go to about do it? a shotgun approach? And, mm -hmm. and when you're looking for, maybe you have a handful of clubs that you've gotten in and you've made relationships, and you can kind of work there a couple times a month or once a month, every other month. You have a handful of those, okay. and then you have the gigs that you're kind of booking out ahead for. Around here would be like festivals, and summer fairs, you're traveling a little bit further. Okay. Uh, and those take more time, more preparation to kind of submit either an application or you're, you you got to call them and hit them up six months in advance. you got to keep a calendar mm -hmm. to remind yourself when these people are actually booking their gigs. And if you're not on top of that, then you know usually when you think of it, it's too late. Mm -hmm. So as you've got to build up your contacts and have kind of be very organized with keeping uh, you know detailed lists of you know compiling what are the festivals, what are the gigs, the, the club gigs that you can get around the area, um, and then a lot of them you just have to keep shooting out emails and calling and sending out packages, and you might send out fifty and get one or two gigs out of it. That's not an uncommon ratio of failure. And what's that typical package that you kind of send to like a manager? Uh, bio, CD. Right now you ha you should have everything on a uh, digital format though. So you've got a website, all your links, maybe all your music uploaded to a server or to some kind of website. You have all that. You've got your promo, your uh, history of gigs maybe. Some people would want to see the tunes that you do, the repertoire for you know, parties or weddings, they want to have a tune list. It's different for, for every different gig, but I mean, you have to have all that stuff together to even go out and approach a lot of these you know, bigger paying, higher paying gigs if you don't want to pay you know, $50 dinner gigs all the time. Sure. Down here first. Yeah, could you guys just comment on like the state of the Portland jazz scene right now? It's a killer. Oh, okay. Since I haven't said anything, maybe I can answer your question and answer Charlie's question and make a tie of the things together. Um, so, I'm going to do a workshop for young musicians. It's called Entering the Profession. So, I have blogs that workshop and a ton of stuff. There's stuff on George's website. There's probably stuff on Dave's blog about this. But if we want to back up a little bit, I like to always like to see things in terms of a historical context. Okay. So if we looked back 500 years and we said, what was the role of a musician in a community? Okay. The musician is a mute member of the community. It's not somebody who's set aside. It's not somebody who does. It's, I mean, first of all, the whole community of music, and maybe the, the musician was like the griot or the people that were functioning as musicians in the community. They were the people that led the community into music. Right? So around the 19th century, um, in classical music, and you know, Germany or Austro-Hungary, I mean, Franz Liszt was the very first musician entrepreneur. He was the person who sort of said, "No, I am not a community member. I am special. You have to pay to see me. Ticketed concerts, um, solo recitals, composed music." And so, what what that 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 was a change in the model of how a musician relates to a community. Right? The musician wasn't a community member offering a service playing for funerals, weddings, celebrations, commemorating the life of the community. It was somebody who says, I do what I want to do, you come to me and you take what I offer you, right? And pay me, right? So in that separation, in that schism between the musician as a community member and we developed the industry of music, right? So when you talk about a career in music, is a griot in Africa, do they have a career in music? They're never paid, ever. Right? But they're in the community functioning. What is, what is the comparison here? Are there people, so the scene I like to look at the most um, in one way is the bluegrass scene. Right? Because in some way there are famous bluegrass players. There are f uh, relatively few. But there's tons of practitioners. And the idea of money and economy is not the driving force of the bluegrass music scene. 
right? It's a sharing of music. So there are people who play every night for free. There are people who teach, who offer schools. People set up shop in many different ways, but their primary idea is how do I serve the community? So even when Dave is talking about getting a gig at a festival, I like to come, I like to come with that idea. I say, okay, the festival, what's its purpose? What is it trying to do? Portland Jazz Festival. What is the Portland, what is the Portland Jazz Festival's purpose? I think that's a good question as a musician who wants to participate in it to ask. What are they trying to do? Do some research. Find that out. What kind of not not just strategically for yourself, but in the community. How do they function? What are they trying to accomplish? And then the next question is, what can I offer? How can I help? Now, if I'm famous, I can sell tickets. I can make them money, right? I can fill a, a fifteen hundred seat hall. They definitely need that. If I'm you, I can't do that. What else can I offer? Well, there's a whole other, I mean, one of the things, one of their other goals, their mission, and you could look online and read their mission statement, right? Um, one of the other things they want to do is they want to connect the community to musicians. So they hire all these local musicians to play these gigs, and they don't pay a lot of money. And so, on the one hand, it's not the same gig. It's not the same relationship to the community that they're offering the local musicians. There are some local musicians who feel like they're well known enough of, that they shouldn't that the, that the festival shouldn't be offering that opportunity. It should be offering them a better opportunity. I'm not here to argue that. I mean that's that's sort of between the musicians and the festival. But if I'm trying to get a, a gig at the festival, I'm basically saying, where do our where do our purposes intersect? Where do they interact and what can I offer to them? Right? And so part of in order to do that, part of what you have to do is you have to start, as Alan said, building relationships. Right? Not just the person who books the festival, but everybody at the festival, people on the board, people on, I mean, so if you really, so it's, I kind of like think of it as like dating, right? If you, if you just want to, you know, hook up, that's what I get, right? If you want a relationship, um, then that's going to take a lot more work. That's going to take some knowledge, some vulnerability on your part, some legwork, some flowers, some all kinds of stuff, right? So, I mean, I'm just saying, if you just, if most musicians that I met, not so much now, but when I was coming up, all they wanted was a hookup. They just, you know, come on, just give it to me. I don't want to spend the time. I don't have, you know, no. It's like the, and I remember mean, talking to Andy Lugerson, Busy Owners, mm -hmm. Busy Owners. Mm -hmm. I used to just go into the club. Um, and just in the afternoons, so and I just talked to him. I was like, "Well, so what's it like going to a jazz club?" You know? He's like, "Oh man, such and such a waste of time. They, they just light bill. I had to pay this you know, the mafia dude." Came in. I mean, so I start to understand. I start to have a relationship. I start to have a relationship with him and see what his needs are. So that when I'm, first of all, when I'm asking for a gig, I'm not just musician number 150 today asking for a gig. I'm somebody who's actually taken the time to sit down with him and try to to say, "How can I help you?" How can I help you? Here's what I have to offer. You know, what do you need? What can I do? And sometimes it's like, I can't really do much. I don't have much of a following. And the thing is, if you take that information, you say, he says, you can't really do much for me. Well, what would you, what would it take? I got to have 50 people in here to make my nut. I can't pay my waitresses without 50 people. That's my short-term goal. I need 50 people that I can guarantee will come out. Maybe it's 100, you know, ivories. Same thing. You want to get ivories? He's got a number. He's got a number of people that he needs paying covers to pay his waitresses, keep the lights on. You need to know that number. And when you're ready to meet that number, when you think there's a reasonable chance that you can do something for him, then you go see him. And you say, take a chance on me. Give me this gig. I know you need to have 75 people. I will do it. I promise you I will do it. And mean it. And know that it's true. You do it once, the second gig is easy. You follow up, you say, hey, when can we do this again? You have a relationship. It's not a one-night stand. So, to answer your question just briefly, um, I have students, Kyle Williams, they started a company called Retake Productions. They write music for silent films. And they book, they do the shows at the Hollywood Theater. And they sell out. They went, they went to school here. They're jazz majors. Now, I didn't teach them to write music for silent films, right? But they had, this own, they had their own interest. And so, I guess what I'm saying is that jazz in this community is everywhere. Because I know, because my students are doing it. They're not knocking on the door to get a gig at Ivory's, but they're starting new venues, they're putting stuff in clubs, they're figuring out ways, they're starting record companies, they're starting nonprofits, they're consulting, they're working on the radio. Doing, I mean, jazz is everywhere in this town, but it's not in the old way that it's like, give me a job, 
it's not that's not that's not the model. And I would posit that that's not the model for our culture for at least the next 25, 30 years in anything. Doctors, lawyers, doesn't matter. There's no more of this just I have a degree, give me a job. It's not gonna happen. So I feel like we have the best possible preparation for that life. Because we never we we never expected it. We never thought we were gonna get a medical school degree and then just go on to the hospital. So we're ready to like create, to find stuff, to make stuff happen. So I feel like it's a great scene because there's a lot of young energy and it's, and it's not super expensive to live and you know there's a good ecology for trying to plant some roots, but it takes a lot of work. That's my that's all I have to say. Um, I have a nuts and bolts. Um, it's also covered this part of this is covered very well in that book. <clears throat> and we talk about it a lot here. Um, I'll give you an example. Well, it, it's it's how you want to work on yourself and how people perceive you. And and one of the one of the things that was mentioned that Dave mentioned contacts. Contacts is is huge. Making contacts, making sure people know who you are. Uh, um, this this three days would be a good example. There's a lot of there about what one two. There's a whole bunch of contacts that you could be making with each other and with us. Um, I would want to make a point of introducing myself to Farnell because Farnell's a happening guy, and if, if you know he may need a bass player someday, or he might need some help with something like like the way Daryl. If you could make contact, you know, with your teachers, with musicians that you meet, make let them know you. You know, I've already met a couple of people that I haven't met before, but it's been very nice and very favorable. Uh, the other thing, when I just it, if somebody calls me, people will call and they'll say, you know, I need I need a 12-string guitar player or something for a party. It pays 300 bucks. And they'll say, can you send a student or whatever? And so I will say, I will sit down and I'll go through my list and I might think, well, this guy's really good, but you know what? He's late. He's late for class. More than half the time he comes in late. I can't recommend him because I don't want the person, because he might be late for the gig I'm recommending him for, and then the person that I've made the contact with is going to go, well, I'm not calling PSU anymore if they're going to send somebody like that, right? I might go to the next one on the list, and it might be, you know, something similar to that. Well, I've called him, and he didn't call me back. You know, I sent him an email, and he didn't send me an email back for two or three days. So he's not on my list anymore. Um, this person, you know, you, you know where I'm going with this. Everybody knows that that the, you need to make the best presentation you can possible. The idea that where George is saying, if you do, if 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 you play, if you take a gig, if you accept a gig, I could be playing like the worst country western gig on the planet, and but you have to approach that with the idea that the guy that's sitting at the bar having a beer is the guy that might be it, that just might be. Chick Corea, and who knows, he likes country western music and beer. He sees you playing, or something, the, your presentation that you give to people is everything. And it starts, it just, it starts here. I mean, I have literally, I know, I, and I'm sure we've had conversations about sending and making recommendations where we've gone, ah, man, the guy's, he's perfect. He's perfect, but I don't know, can't take a chance. I had one kid. That, that was going to uh, hire out for it was a, it was subbing it was a major sub gig and uh, without giving too many details and so this person went and subbed for this other person and then a couple of days later I asked the the leader I said how'd it go and he went oh, God don't don't even ask me I said what 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 do you mean he said attitude he just came in like like this was the stupidest thing, like he was saving me, was late, you know, just this and that, not good about it. And uh, so I happened to mention that to somebody else. Well, oh, never, nevertheless, I didn't call this person again. But, and I mentioned it to somebody in passing who mentioned it to somebody in passing. And I'm not making this up. It's like within, within about three or four days, this person lost about two years worth of contacts and work because of one one mis one thing one it was 
wasn't even a misperception. It was just, it was that, you'd be, it's so easy the way those things can, you know, and, and, and this is a wonderful person, and he's, he's, you know, he's, he's recovered, but probably, but he, I don't even think he ever realized how many contacts just went, boop, boop, just like Dom, from one thing. I think what's interesting about that is that's not something that you have to spend hours in the practice room dealing with. No. It's not this. It's nothing that you really should have to take lessons. No, no. You know, because yeah. that's the thing. We're all like, well, how do I get to become a great musician? And this is something that you can just figure out in hopefully a few minutes. Yeah. You're like, okay, I'm gonna. I mean, having a generally good reputation as somebody who's on time and is easy to work with and who will learn the music and is somebody you want to work with. I mean, that person will you know, be more successful than the person that, I mean, they might be the best player ever, but, I mean, for example, I remember I, I used to go to Scotland a lot, and, and I was never really happy with the drummer. I would do what we call a single. I would go play with Scottish musicians, and the drummers that they always would hook me up with, I, I just always was very unhappy with their musicianship. Now, they were nice people, but... And then uh, one time they put me with this drummer, his name was Patty, but he was Scottish. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, so this guy was amazing. I mean, I was like, wow, where has this guy been all these years? And they said, well, you know, sometimes he won't show up on the gig and they'll find him on a park bench somewhere. And, and he was just one of these cats that like just was so inconsistent and had some, you know, chemical issues. and. They just said, they said, we really hate to use him because we can't, we never know whether he's going to show or not. You know, this guy was incredible. I mean, this guy could have been on the scene in New York easily. And he was just kind of blacklisted. I think we all know people, or of people, you know. That's what, and not to get back to the book, one of the things he's talking about how you can be a contractor over, and he's, his, his idea was the same thing. It was like, you, you get called for, you need to put a clarinet player in this show, right? Clarinet player A is the best clarinet player on the East Coast, bar none, but he's he can be late and he can miss gigs. Clarinet B is almost as good, totally dependable, shows up every time. You know, who are you going to hire? It's like, it makes sense. I suppose it's all relative because, you know, there was a period where Freddie Hubbard was... Uh, you know, and substance issues, and, and was known for doing a lot of really crazy stuff, but people would still take the risk because he was Freddie Hubbard, you know. How many people in this room can say they're on the level of Freddie Hubbard? I don't think anybody, you know. So, anyway. So, the two things I would say that you could work on with yourself, and I talk to students about this, one um, is what Alan says about relationships. So, I mean, because basically everything we've said up here is all about can I make good relationships? And I think the, the, the picture you're getting is it's not easy. It takes work, right? And so you can keep you, everything, I mean, because you want to make money at this. Now, if you don't care, if you just want to play some music, you can kind of ignore all this stuff because you can do it on your own with people that you like in situations that you care about in no time else. But if you're trying to make a business out of this and earn, earn some income, then I think this is something you have to pay attention to. So. How are, how are the relationships, and how can I make good relationships with as many people as possible? And to be really good at it, it's going to get you a lot of work. You're going to be one of the most employed people. And the second thing is to continually asking yourself, how am I being perceived? How am I perceiving you right now? I mean, think about, think about our interactions with the past couple days. And it's not, I mean, again, this is only because you want to do this as a commercial enterprise for yourself, that you need to be really aware of this. How am I how am I perceiving you? And so you start to look at, well, geez, how, how am I dressed? Not as a value judgment, but because I want to make a business of this. Because I'm because everything I do now as a freelancer indicates income. So when I have to so let's say that I got a call on my phone right now for somebody that says, dude, we got a single gig right now, solo gig, um, for any instrumentalist. Somebody from your workshop can come down in 10 minutes, they can make 200 bucks. Okay, so this is, this is what I got to choose from, right? So, now think about the stuff we've been talking about. Think about how am I going to make the decisions. I'm going to make the decisions based on interactions that I've had, conversations that we've had, 
how you present yourself, your level of confidence, your level of competence. So playing is part of it, but it may not even be the most important part of it. So I guess I just ask that if you want to be in business for yourself, um, as a you know, if you want to be doing this music thing for business, then how people perceive you is super, super important. And you can decide, you know what, this is who I am, and that group of people who don't like this, I will never work for them. And if it's a small group of people, you're cool. Or if, you know, it's not the primary group of people that you need to pay you to make a living, then you're cool. I have I've had friends that from my college days that played music a certain way and never wanted to play any other way than that. And they're still doing that to this day. And I admire, I totally admire, you know, they, but he, he enjoys a 10-foot studio apartment and, and is happy to do that. But he, they, he's done that, and that's fine. You can make that decision. It's very admirable in some senses, but it may not fit with but, but your idea of what's successful. A lot of people, when they're younger, make that decision out of sort of arrogance and insecurity, as opposed to a true self-knowledge. Like, you know what, this is just not who I am. I'm not going to pretend to be any other way. When you're 20, I'm, I'm going to argue you're 18, 17, I'm arguing that you don't have enough knowledge of yourself to say definitively, this is just who I am and I'm not going to be any other way. So you might want to experiment. You might want to at least have the, and even if you decide not to do a thing about it, having the information that, you know, it's like, man, Farnell's going to wear these baggy jeans to the gig, right? And knowing, if he knows, if he knows how I think about it, he knows how he's perceived. It's like, people, people may find, some people may find me threatening. You know, that's all right. So he can decide to counter it, to go along with it, to ignore it, but he's he's in the power position. He's making the decision, but he understands how he's being perceived, and so he can act accordingly. So those are the two things that I would suggest that you might want to think about. How much that good thing? Yeah, but it's funny, you know, I will say that the same thing applies to me. I mean, I, when I give this advice to students, I think about myself. You know, it's like, okay, I come to school every day. There are people that come to this building in this music department that wear a jacket every single day. As you can see, I'm not one of those people. Neither is Charlie, right? But um, I, it's, I would be fooling myself if I didn't think that there is a perception that goes around here based on me. And if, I mean, I might... It might do me some good to think about, I wonder, am I missing out on anything? I mean, normally, you know, it's like you get to a certain position in life, you're like, ah, oh, cool, everybody likes me, everybody knows me. But it's nice even for me to re-examine and go, what, how am I perceived? How do the students perceive me? How does the administration perceive me? How am I? Just to have the knowledge, to not be walking around in a cloud of ignorance. And I can decide, eh, yeah, I'm cool with that. Or I can decide, wow, dang, I'm missing stuff I never even imagined. I, uh, I want to change that perception. I, I need to change. I need to do something. I want to be in the position to say that, as opposed to just sort of have stuff happen to me and I don't know why. So, I think it applies to your whole life. 